I mean, we've not. I mean, because we've not talked about Mandy here before. Um, I wonder whether I could just to start with just kind of just go back to the the beginning because obviously there was a pilot and then you had series one and two and uh, and series three. I mean, I know you know that already. Yeah. Um, but um, what, what was the thinking behind Mandy originally? Where, where did the idea for the show come from? Um, she was a sort of amalgam of people that I'd known over the years. Uh, one of whom I went to primary school with. <laughs> And, uh, she, uh, you know, I never name her, but I wonder if she knows. <laughs> <laughs> I always wonder. Uh, but, um, yeah, so, so uh, I, w I was offered a 15-minute pilot by the BBC, and I'd always wanted to do this, this character. I'd been practising it with Michael Spicer years ago. Uh, we used to meet up with just, like, a bag of wigs. <laughs> And, and try out sort of characters. And I always liked the idea of this woman. And uh, so when the BBC offered me 15 minutes, I thought it oh, was the perfect opportunity to try out this character. That was all it was. I thought I could try it out. I didn't think anyone would like it. <laughs> I just thought it would be, you know, just a thing to do. And, 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 and the person who you based it on was that, I mean, in terms of like the sort of the physical, sort of the way that she walks and the face, I mean, it's obviously exaggerated, I'm guessing, but well, was, it was, was, it that was all like there? three, no, it was like three, maybe four different people that I'd seen. A uh, girl from primary school. There was, there was a lot of women in the 90s in Manchester that looked like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so that look was a very 90s Manchester look. Yes. So it's a few different people, really. Yeah. And 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 how easy do you find it to kind of inhabit that role? Because it, because you know, it, I mean, physically, and I say there's the walk and everything about it is a very, you know, it's, it's very different. Well, from the usual, walk just came out of just trying to make the crew laugh one day. <laughs> they said, "Oh, just walk, you know, just walk." We just needed a shot of me walking in front of a shop, and I just did a stupid walk just to make everyone laugh. And then they was like, they kept it, so I, to, I was locked into doing that walk. <laughs> I've been practicing to try and do that face, and I can't do it. Can I mean, you not? It, no, did, did, did it come easily to you? Yeah, because it's like it's, it's like she's chewing the 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 side of her mouth. <laughs> that was the girl at primary school. And um, when you're when you're working a kind of like a fifteen minute format, I mean, you, when you pack it full of stuff, I mean, there's yeah. lots of different kind of kind of plot lines and stories going on in any one episode. Yeah. But is that is that kind of more liberating to do in fifteen minutes? I think it is. I think the fifteen minutes is the way forward. I love it because because uh, you haven't got the time for a half hour plot, a storyline. So it's more like a long sketch, and you can do anything. Mm. Uh, I think it's it's. I love doing a fifteen minute because I, I grew up watching Laurel and Hardy, you know, Harold Lloyd, and they were often that short. And it was just a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you just jammed in any jokes you could think of, and mm. that was it. And that comes across, doesn't it? Because it's very physical comedy. There are moments in there which are almost kind of like a sort of silent comedy feel, even though obviously the sound yeah. and the music and stuff. You're kind of, you, you, you're, there's, there's no dialogue, shall we say, in certain mm. sequences. And that's all come from that kind of background you've got of yeah, watching those shows. Yeah, I always loved, always loved watching silent, silent movies, Buster Keaton. But weirdly, there were never any women doing it. I could never really work out why. There are a few, but they're kind of quite. You know, they're, they're down deep in the archive. Yeah. We've done a few events oh, here really? and then um, we should we should share some of those. Yes, with you. I'd like to see that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in terms of um, obviously, I, 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 right from square one, I mean, I think in the first uh, the pile you had like um, Carol Decker in it. Yeah. So you've kind of you know, you've always had this thing of kind of like different people just kind of quite randomly kind of coming into your stories. Yeah. Are they people that you like really wanted to work with? Or I mean, how did that work? Were they people that when you were writing it, you thought, wouldn't it be great if? I mean, how did that come about? Yeah, often, often I just write the storyline and think, who would be the best people for this storyline, for this part? But from the beginning, I always wanted to work with Roger Sloman. I mean, he's, he's, worked, I, he's worked twice with you now, hasn't he? Twice, series two no, and series. He's I, I just, well. He's here, and he's here tonight. <laughs> Where is Roger? Oh, there's Roger. There he is. Because, like, every other co comedian, comic actor I know are obsessed with Nuts in May and think it's the best thing ever. And Roger Sloman is just... Yeah. It's probably the, the best comedy performance I've ever seen. So to be able to work with him, it's just like, it blows my mind. Is that why he came back for, us, for, for, for this, another yes, role? Yes, I but in want the him series. in every, everything I do. <laughs> I 
have to say, one of, one of my, that my happiest experience of working at the BFI was during our Mike Lee season. I sat here on stage with Roger right, and a yeah, whole, yeah. Uh, in fact, it was a complete reunion. We didn't film it, which is kind of one of the things that will, will crush me forever, but it's one of the yeah. best events we've done, apart from tonight. <laughs> so, um, and we've all, I mean, just because we've obviously, you know, sort of singled Roger out, there are some other people in the audience who are in the show. Obviously, yes. um, I should say we've got Michelle Greenidge here. Yes. Yeah, will, you start, will, you start, will, you, will you stand up? Stand up. Because not, not everybody can Let see you. Let them see you. I mean, Lola is so in in oh, to the show. She's such with a great Michelle. character. So funny that accent. I just yeah. love it. And, and and when you're writing for Lola, um, I mean, is there other things that um, that Michelle brings to the character, or was it already there on the page? She's multi talented. She does this thing where. Uh, she can do like the, a crying baby noise. <laughs> Would you do it now, here? We're going to bring a microphone it's, down to Michelle now. It's, rehearsed. Honestly, it's so incredible. She did it one day for the crew and everyone was like, where's that crying baby coming from? Listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely incredible. I bet they don't know you can do that on Doctor Who, do they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, and there's also, of course, the great Linda Lusardi is here. Linda Lusardi is here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Still fit. Yeah. <laughs> And um, when, with some of those kind of more physical sequences, those sequences that are more around, let's say, there's a, there might be a, a music track playing or something, yeah. but yeah. Is, is, are, are they all very kind of carefully written to the script or is that something you, you, you explore on set? <clears throat> um, no, it's, it's written. I always think, what could happen next? And then you think, I've always wanted to do a, a really long fall that goes on forever. <laughs> I don't know why. That's fantastic. It goes on slightly too long. You know? <laughs> yeah, and it, and it is a fantastic scene. Yeah, it? And, and actually the end where she stands up and you think it's all over and then she falls out the window <laughs> was taken from, um, what was it, Ben? It was, it, was, it was Rick Mayle did it, didn't it? That's it, Mr uh, Jolly. Yeah. Comic Mr strip. Jolly lived next door, the comic strip presents. He did this fall out of a window that I, I watched about 500 times, didn't I? Because I thought, because he keeps his whole body straight as he falls out the window. And I thought it was absolutely incredible. So that, that was stolen. And um, are, you, are you quite a disciplined writer in terms of do you kind of lock yourself away at a certain point and you just make yourself deliver or does it have to be on your terms? I don't know. It, um, I sort of th try and think about what I want to write about a storyline and then just just keep thinking what would happen what would happen if that happened like do you remember the thing in the news the other day i don't know if you saw it with the, there was a woman in wales and she got the back of her yeah she got the back of her coat stuck on some shutters and it lifted her up <laughs> off the shutters and the brilliant thing is she grabs her shopping trolley <laughs> And I thought I was so jealous because I thought I'm never going to be able to come up with anything as good as that. It was like beautiful. I mean, are there any ideas that you just haven't been able to deliver because they've been too outlandish or too expensive? Because I mean, you, you know, you've got to play. Do you know what? Through. I haven't really uh, let the lack of budget stop me, as you could, <laughs> as you could see by the plane episode. I mean, no, no, there's I Robin and Lucy from the plane episode. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I thought that looked really good. I actually it thought did it, look I really thought it good. worked really well up here. I thought it, it was very cinematic in lots yeah, of respects. Yeah, I know. I really wasn't ex expecting it to look that good. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. and, and um, <clears throat> but so, so, so basically, I mean, because there's no kind of genre or, I mean, it's, it's completely blue sky thinking, isn't it, when you, mm. when you approach it? You, you, you've just... Yeah, because like, they're you know, self-contained you... and anything could happen. So it means you, you can just go mad and just do absolutely anything. And, and in terms of... Um, and, and, and we'll go on to sort of the directing side in a moment, but in terms of your kind of comedy influences, you talked about the silent comedy stuff. Is there anybody else who has particularly kind of influenced you or you look at when you're kind of directing or writing? I don't know if they've influenced, probably influenced me, but there's people I like, like obviously 
Peter Sellers and Hancock. I grew up watching watching them. And Mae West <laughs> is the, like completely underrated. Yeah. And I don't know why they don't really show any of her films now. Well, you're in the right place. I'm in the right place. Yeah. It's Peter Sellers centenary next year. Is it? Yeah. Oh. If you come so you to never that. know. There might be something coming up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then just in terms of sort of the directing side, is that something you've kind of come to instinctively? Is something you trained at? Is it something you just picked up on other people's sets? Where did that come from? Uh, I just thought it was probably cheaper if I did it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you but you haven't made it easy for yourself, have you? Like some of those things that you've been directing there, they're pretty epic in scale for 15 minutes. Yeah, I suppose so. But I mean, we've got, I mean, I work really closely with Pete Rowe, the cameraman, who's incredible and he helps me a lot. So it's really the performances that I'm directing. And I, I don't need to direct performances because you're getting amazing people and they just let them do what they do. And you had your kind of horror kind of doll episode. I mean, the, I mean that puppet is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, so you know that that was based on Trilogy of Terror, Karen Black. Right, OK. Yeah, oh, oh, well, well, yeah, that was, that was all stolen from Trilogy of Terror. <laughs> Borrowed. 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 It was an homage. But the, pu the puppet, I mean, the, the puppet was, was presumably puppet. made especially for... The... It was like four, four or five different puppets with different faces that would be swapped in, so if it looked a bit angrier, we'd get the angry yeah. puppet. And all the crew were, were having a go at, at, at making the puppet move. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the puppet is, is, is incredible. I would, we just wish we had it here to show people. But um... I've got them. They're, they're around. There's five in a garage if anyone wants to buy them. <laughs> you, if you want to make an offer. <laughs> There's Pete Rowe. Oh, yeah, he had a go at... Um... <laughs> you had a go at making the baby move as well, didn't you, at one point? Yeah, that's right. Very good. And then um, <laughs> in terms of, like, I mean, the hair and makeup, I guess, and all that, I mean, I mean you, you give them a run for their money as well. I was thinking not just in terms of... You know, your own look, the, the incredible hairstyles, mm. but also um, Nana's feet. Nana's were feet. They were, they, were, they, were, they were special, weren't they? I love the reaction that Nana's feet got. <laughs> and, 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 and I know that perhaps it was cheaper to kind of cast yourself in that role, but, it, yeah. but, um, but was it a sort of an exciting kind of comic challenge to do that? And also yeah, from a directing point of view to pull it off. Yeah, yeah, it took a long time, didn't it? Lots of locked off shots and... Uh... You always knew from the start when you were writing that was going to be... No, it. I didn't. I thought I did think about who could I cast. What, I, but it's very difficult to cast a, an elderly actress. There's no one sort of old, old and ugly enough. Do you know what I mean? Most actresses, they look glamorous into the, like, their 90s, you know. I wanted someone who looked... Look the age, <laughs> you know. One time, from a directing point of view, did that not, I mean, did that challenge not kind of, um, you know, sort of worry you a little bit? Or were you just so confident that like, we're at a time now where, with, with technology being what it is, you can make those things work? What do you mean? What do well, you mean? Like well, having, well, having the two of you in screen at the same time and all that kind of stuff. Oh, right. All those tricks about when you have to deliver a line as both characters. Yeah, no, that was great. I mean, it was difficult. <laughs> I mean, everyone did it. I, I just sat there, really. But I mean, in terms of like, because when you. Because you were directing that and you were having to kind of come up with how that was going to work and how that was going to look and so forth. Yeah, to a certain extent, but then other people like Pete Rowe and, you know, and, and Kenny, our lovely producer, they all were all... There he is! Hello, Kenny! <laughs> and, and it felt, and I might be wrong, but, um, but it felt like in Series 3 we saw a more kind of vulnerable side to Mandy that we've seen before. Yes, we did, not um, In the early ones, she's always kind of very cool and collected, but... We kind of see her being kind of, you know, sort of harassed by a, a demon baby. And, yeah, uh, and then no one turns up to a party. And on, the, and on the plane as well. But she's very heroic on the, on the plane, actually. Yeah, yeah, very heroic, yeah. I mean, I mean <laughs> and, and the reason I say that, though, is because, is, is that just because Mandy's one of those characters you literally could pull her in any direction? You can literally do anything with her. And that's the beauty of it. You can do anything. And, and there's some very dark stuff in there, obviously, not just like the, like the falling down the stairs, but... You know, in the operating theatre, there's a lot of kind of, and then later on, there's the, the abattoir scene and stuff. I mean, do, do, I mean, I don't think that, I don't think that's particularly dark. I mean, I'm talking about all the blood splattering with the, in the abattoir. Right. Or, yeah, I mean, that happens, you know. <laughs> Meat eaters. It, it does not, not normally in a, in a comedy show. Uh, yeah, no, no, and it should do. I want more blood splattering in comedy shows. And, 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 but is that has that always been that you kind of your sense of humour has always kind of veered towards a slightly? Well, I don't think of it as dark. It I is. don't. I don't. Someone falls downstairs, <laughs> you know, she shoots a cow. <laughs> 
and these are all things that happen in real life. You know, it's not like oh. it's anything that's... I mean, the evil baby, yeah, that's, that's quite dark. The evil... Baby in an air fryer, that's dark, yeah. <laughs> or the, uh, the metallic calipers, the... Uh, yeah, the that's fryer. not dark, that's light. <laughs> metallic well, calipers. Comparatively, maybe yeah. it is, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and where... Do, I mean, is this something that, as long as the commission comes along, you'd be happy just to kind of keep on going with? Because... I think so, know. as long as I've come up with, with uh, enough ideas that I think are good enough and people seem to like it, then I might, I might do more. We'll see. One person well, does. <laughs> I mean, from, from, the, from the response that you got tonight, obviously, you know, the, the show's got a, you know, a, a, there's a lot of interest in the show. And I think actually when it first um, came out in the first series, it was one of those kind of like, there's a sort of lockdown phenomena for a lot of people, I think, you know, because it was during a really miserable time and people were really searching for stuff and not, a lot of new stuff was being produced. So, I mean, that, 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 that was kind of like a real light, I think, for a lot of people at that dark time. Um, I mean, just just kind of going back in terms of, were, were you surprised how how well the show was? I mean, that's a bizarre question yeah. to ask. Were you surprised yeah. how, how, yeah, how well? Yeah, I was because I thought uh, when we did the pilot, I was terrified of it going out because I suddenly thought it, we were we were in lockdown, and I thought, oh my god, I think more people are going to see it. Yeah. I yeah. sort of didn't want anyone to see it because I th I thought it'd just go under the radar. I try out this character, and it'd be over. But then. Then people were indoors and they were watching these. <laughs> so loads of people saw it. And and the the weekend before it went out, I I, I said to Ben, um, I I think we should ring the BBC and tell them not to put it out. Wow. I think it's a mistake. I think it's mad. It's utterly mental. What have I done? Please, can we not show it? But at what point did you realise that it had kind of broken through? I mean, I guess the reviews when were When it went and out and it was fine, nobody killed me, yeah. <laughs> and, and do people... Because I know there's lots of things that people know you for, but do people come and, and, and approach you as Mandy on the street? Approach me as Mandy? Well, well not as Mandy, in terms of... Do they, do, they, do they want you to pull the face and do all that kind of stuff? They don't ask me, but I can sense that sometimes that's what they're after. <laughs>
but the rest was her. And and it was me falling out of the window. I really wanted to yeah. get that right. <laughs> I, I thought about that for years. But not the actual fall. What? Not the actual fall, though. Oh, yeah, that was a dummy. The, oh. the actual fall. <laughs> the actual fall was a mannequin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, probably the feet. <laughs> I remember the feet bit going down well. Uh, but my favourite bit is the bit in the, the where I'm, no one's turned up to the party and I'm really upset and I've got the party hat on. And and uh, Lola's going on about how Shirley Bass is still really glamorous. And, and, and I turn to her and say, oh, stop going on about her. And the, the, the little bit of elastic yeah. from the hat lands across my face. That's my favourite bit of the whole series. Wow, is it? Yeah. But I can understand that's probably not everyone else's. It's, it's a niche moment. It but, is, uh, yeah, but, but I love worth that. Worth re-watching, I think, isn't it, for that reason? <laughs> so I, I'll come up with ideas like... Uh, like, like a while back I was in a changing room trying on a pair of jeans and, and I felt like I was going to lose my footing as I was putting my legs in the jeans and I reached out to grab the curtain but I thought, what would happen if I'd have grabbed the curtain the curtain would have come down and I'd have rolled out with the jeans around my ankles it's that, it's that. So, I, that so I take that bit and I think, right, you start there what would happen? It's like, what would the, be the worst thing that could happen next? <laughs> Continually. <laughs> Do you know what that tangerine thing came from? Uh, Joe Wilkinson. Right. Who told me that his only skill is to swallow a tangerine whole. And he can do it, but it might kill him. <laughs> so each time he does it, it's a big risk. And he doesn't really do it anymore because of the risk of death. But I always remembered it and thought, oh, that would be a good thing for her to, to do. And, and, and when you were filming it, how far did you get? I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, uh, I did it. But there wasn't a kind of a quick there's, cut. There's a kind of, you have to really get that juice out in one big... You know, you have to squeeze it and make it small, as small as it'll go. Well, we've got a tangerine actually down here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate to say it, but Mandy would probably... She'd probably win. She's a bit rougher. <laughs> come to the BFI, Diane, we said. Come and hear the most culturally significant I know. question. Look at the questions you get. <laughs> come, and, come and have you know, <laughs> scrutiny and uh, you know, celebrate. Um, I mean, there, there is one thing just from when you were talking before, you were talking about how you tried stand-up. Is that something you'd ever revisit? Um, not, not unless it all really went tits up. <laughs> I mean, was, that, was, was, that, was that an experience you enjoyed? Or? I did it for nearly ten years, you know, and... The days that I had a gig, it would ruin my whole day, knowing that in the evening I had to go somewhere and do 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, but, but it was better than doing telesales. So, Is know. that the same like you know, today, when you know you've got to share your work with an audience? Is that something as well that you're kind of feeling kind of a bit trepidatious about? Or is that enjoyable? It, it was a bit trepidatious because it's been so long since I've seen them and you never know how you're going to react to yourself to them, whether you're going to go, oh, actually, no, it's not how I remembered it. There's that kind of feeling. But, um, but no, it's, it's lovely. I mean, everyone came here if they're on a card. It's not like... <laughs> that, but, but Roger Sloman. People that liked it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they came here to, to, cel to celebrate Mandy with you. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and nice um, and uh, as Ben said before, the show is going to be transmitting um, on BBC Two. I think it was the twenty seventh. Twenty seventh, I think. Yeah, um, ten o'clock. So um, you haven't got very long to to wait and see the rest of it. Although you may not have 
450 people in your front room with you when you're watching it. But um, a big, big thank you for being here and sharing Mandy with us. Diane Morgan, thank you. Yeah.